Welcome to the Healing Arts of Being You. Today we sit down with Becca Dodmead, a remarkable woman passionate about bringing light into people's lives through humor and understanding. As a nurse who has had to fight for her life in a broken system that failed her, Becca has redirected her energy to educating and bringing awareness to trauma-informed care and advocating for those unable to make a stand for themselves. This episode is a longer one, but I wanted to allow you to experience the full weight of her story and didn't want to rob you of any of the quirky little moments in the second half either. Stick around for this hilariously heartwarming masterclass on finding light in the darkness. Let's get started. I have to, t- I have to share a basketball story. Yes. So when I was in, I think a freshman in high school, mm-hmm. I made the JV team. Nice. But like barely. And the first game, I actually managed to start, but it was a half court, and I ended up scoring um, a point for the other team. And, like, looking back after, my coach was like, this (laughs) But, like, out of the corner of my eye, I was like, yeah. Right? But, like, nobody was in front of me. It was a beautiful layup. (laughs) They're all cheering on everyone. You know what? It was probably the most exciting moment because everyone was cheering for you, you know? Well... They were saying something. <laughs> they were, everyone was yelling something. <laughs> something yeah. right. You're on the probably. And was like, I was trying to tell you. And I was like, I thought you were just excited. Yeah. And so then I was, I hung out on the bench after that. <laughs> <laughs> but. Oh, oh, man, my that's God. so good. I'm crying. You are. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. I have to have brought a tissue box with me today, apparently. Yeah. Emotions are running high. Emotions. emotions are running high. Yes. All right. All right. Lead us in, Becca. Take it away, Becca. <laughs> Hi, I'm Becca. Welcome to my master class on taking trauma and turning it into humor. Oh, I like that. I love that, was, it. that was the best intro. We should probably start having our people do intros now. I love it. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Please. Also, welcome to the healing art of being you, hosting the master class by Becca. <laughs> so, Becca is here today to share some pretty, pretty cool stuff, and we are so excited to learn. Um, but first, let's just get into it. Why don't you just share a little bit about kind of your story and what's been going on in your world? Um, and yeah, we're excited to hear. Okay. Um, so, October of 1982, I was born. <laughs> um, okay, so short version of... <laughs> I would say um, the first 18 years of my life, uh, super awkward kid, got made fun of a lot. Um, You know, I was thinking about this, some pretty ironic stuff, like um, there was a boy that I always like pretended to like, right, because I knew he was gay, but wasn't ready to share that or process that. And so um, I can remember these two kids pulling me aside and saying, who do you really like? We'll write it down and, you know, it's a secret club and, you know, we make connections. And I was like, dumb. So I told them and then they like humiliated me in class, which I know sounds really bad, but for perspective, when I look back and I think about everything I've been through, the fact that life wasn't easy is actually like why I've been able to cope. It's like people have said, and Chelsea knows a lot about my medical stuff, and I'll share that with you. Um, People have said, like, how did you handle that so well? I'm like, well, you know, if you have it easy your whole life and then have something traumatic, it's much harder than if you've been trying to, like, process trauma after trauma, right? So that's definitely me. Um, I... As a young adult, um, had some pretty awful things happen, um, and I, I guess I'm not comfortable sharing like a lot of detail, but I'll just say um, very like devaluing things, and um, you know that kind of play played a part in this medical issue because um, it was a very devaluing experience. Um, And so the medical saga started with just, gosh, 20 years of rough um, periods, 
you know, that kind of culminated in anemia and some malabsorption issues, probably from other things that were just exacerbated by that whole process. And so um, early February of 2020, I went in for a laparoscopic hysterectomy, which is just, you know, small incisions, and they take the equipment and they do the thing, right? And so while they were in there, um, my one of my ovaries was stuck to the top of my rectum. And so um, with endometriosis, as I bet you know, being a PT and you know very well, um, there's a lot of scarring, things, you know, attach themselves together. And up to that point, I had been... Uh, I had experienced a lot of gaslighting mm-hmm. um, from physicians who were like, you don't have endometriosis, like, you're fine. Um, I can re- remember as early as being like 16 and just having like debilitating pain that at the time I didn't understand. And now we have all this hindsight. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was burned by a cartery when that happened and it got missed. And so um, the next day I just was like very uncomfortable. I was at home. I had a huge hematoma, which is just like bleeding under the skin. And, um, I can remember calling the outpatient nurse and saying like, I'm home for my surgery, something, I feel like something's going on. There's this huge hematoma. And she was like, it'll be fine. Just, just put a bandage on it. And I was like, well, but cause being an experienced nurse, I was thinking, you know, usually if you bleed through a pad, you know, an hour, you know, on a wound, that that would be a thing. Um, but it didn't really ooze. It more just grew inside, which I didn't know at that time. Uh, but very dismissive. And so uh, probably 9 o'clock the day after my hysterectomy, I'd been uncomfortable all day. Uh, huge pain in the ass to my mom. I kept sending her out to get stuff right? I had her get some soup and I was like, I, I, this doesn't taste right. Can you go get mashed potatoes? <laughs> she was like over it, but she was being really nice about it. And, um, then I was like, maybe I just need to try to rest. And then when I woke up, I was like, something is wrong. And I was like, I need you to call the ambulance, which I, I don't think I've ridden in an ambulance my whole life. And I've done some dumb things and injured myself. <laughs> so that says something. Um, so I have kind of like glimpses of memory. Um, being in the ER, I kept waking up and like I kind of could see out of the corner of my eye that my heart rate was high, like 130s, 140s. And when I would wake up, I'd look over and see my mom. And looking back, I can see she was trying to do the calm, like I'm not freaking out thing. But at the at that time, I couldn't even process anything except this crazy pain that was like, felt like a sword going through my body and um and the next thing I remember they're taking the monitors off me the ER folks to take me to the floor and I was an educator there so I was like well my heart rate's too high I need to stay monitored he was like I don't know they didn't order it and I'm an old ER nurse from years ago so in my mind I'm like what a little shit right like so I get to the floor terrible pain and I'm telling the PCA um you, you don't want to play tic-tac-toe <laughs> <laughs> we can that was some interesting multitasking yeah um so I said to the PCA which is like a nurse's assistant um like my heart rate's really high I feel like I should be monitored and she did what I think many nursing assistants would do in that situation and was like let's just get you settled and see right she didn't know how to answer to that and you know later when the nurse came in um you know I want to give that nurse's assistant the benefit of the doubt that she you know communicated that when the nurse came in I kept saying like something's something's wrong like you know I should be monitored and the first time I remember saying shouldn't I be a rapid response which is like you know, it's where, regardless of what's happening, you don't have to have definitive evidence that there's something going on. If you're a family member, this is like any hospital in the country, probably since 2010, you know, you have one concern 
no concerns, you have a gut feeling, you can call a rapid response. As and a patient? Get, as a patient, as family, a family member. anything, yeah. Uh, what, pass Visitor, her by. Yeah. yeah, like, it is an expectation that doesn't, you don't have to agree with them. You call the rapid, and then I see nurses. Some hospitals have ER nurses, but there's like a team of critical care nurses that come and assess the situation. You know, maybe fresh eyes will help. And, you know, sometimes... Um, and I'm an ICU nurse and ER nurse myself, and you sometimes you look at the situation and you're like, oh, I see why, you know, they're not sure what's happening. You, you know, assess the situation with them and move on. So I kept, you know, it's like more and more I kept saying, like, something's really wrong. And then I'll never forget. So at this hospital, they, they had uh, people with share rooms. And... Um, I remember this other patient on the other side, and she was, like, yelling, y'all need to do something. Something's wrong with her. And at the time, I was, in my head, I was like, gosh, I wonder if I'm annoying her. Because I was like, ah, ah, like, constantly. Yeah. And, um, but, like, it was just one of those things, like, I couldn't process. And I'm normally someone that can process... I think very similar to you, you can process kind of the emotional state of almost everybody, in, even in a big room. You know, I'm very empathetic. Um, it's served me very well in my career. Um, and frankly, I think when you are somebody that's had a lot of trauma, you know, there's almost like two paths. One where, um, you know, it's very maladaptive and you take your shit out on other people. And another where you're like, you hold on to how that felt so that you can, you know, try to help other people that feel that way. Or if nothing else, like make sure you don't ever do something to make them feel that way. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, this is kind of a, a, the hard part. Yeah. So, um, take all the time you need. I remember, I remember having to use a walker and, like, I'm, I've struggled with my weight, like, probably since I was in my early 20s. And I can remember feeling like, well, she's just big, right? She's dramatic. She's lazy. And I'm, like, using a walker. And I've, I'm a big person, but, like, at that point, I was hiking all the time. I was working out. Um, so it's just like a screws with your head, right? Because I'm like, am I crazy? Like, what is happening with my body? And at some point, they finally consulted a general surgeon, and he wanted me to have a CT, um, which is, you know, you drink some stuff, they take some, you know, pictures that are more in-depth than x-ray uh, to kind of see what's happening with your organs. And I took the first sip of contrast and I like almost came off the bed. I was like, something is wrong. I physically cannot tolerate this. I have never felt like that. I, I can't even describe it. It was just like a visceral reaction. And um, I told the nurse, I need you to call the surgeon. Something's wrong. Something's really wrong. I can't even tolerate this contrast. And I will never forget her reaching over the bed and I don't know if she was grabbing the contrast, but I remember her reaching over the bed and saying, I will call the surgeon and let them know you won't drink. And I was just like, like, this is like one of the many devaluing moments, right? And my dear friend, Natalie, who like, honestly, we were meant to be friends. I think she was meant to save my life, but... It's just the most random friendship. We just happened to click like in one meeting, one time, and became buds. And I think she had maybe been texting with my mom. And something in her said, I need to go check on Becca. And so she came and she, <laughs> and uh, I'm laughing because Natalie told me later, after I was, you know, saved and all that, she said, she says, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I told the nurse, my friend is a big girl, but she's not that big. Something's wrong with her stomach. Mm -hmm. She said that I was just like super descended. And so um, 
she basically told them, so she was an old quality nurse, which is like, um, they're the people in the hospital that measure um, like certain indicators that uh, show you how good the care is, right? So she had previously done that, and so she knew exactly what to say um, so that they would call the rapid response. And what's crazy is she told me later that even the charge nurse was resistant because they just wanted to give me pain medicine. And I know as a critical care nurse, if they had given me any more pain medicine, I would have coded. And like, I might have recovered because I had age on my side, but like, I'm sure I would have ended up like traked and pegged and all that. Um, as it is, you know, certainly fortunate, right? So the next thing, so I have this flash of Natalie standing over me and saying, you're not okay. And in that moment, I have like this memory of feeling like I didn't want her to make the staff mad because if she made them mad, I wouldn't get what I needed. And that like, you know, when you think about your past self, like ooh, that one cuts, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then the next flash of memory I have was somebody grabbing my armband and saying, oh my God, this is Becca. So for background, I had worked at this hospital for nine months in one of the ICUs as a traveler. I had converted to um, permanent staff because I met my current partner there. And so um, they knew me and um, you know, Natalie said I was like gray. I know my pressure was in the seventies, which is bad. Um, I don't know what my heart rate was at that time. I know that, um, when I was going to surgery, it was almost 170, which is bad. And, you know, when I think back, like I remember telling them my baseline's 50, like this is way too high. So, you know, it became all the more frustrating, like over time where I'm like trying to get somebody to listen to me. And of course, just gaslighting by risk management of that hospital. You know, you got to respect, they have to protect their um, assets, their, you know, a business after all. Um, but for me, it just really messed with me. Um, because, you know, speaking with lawyers and everything, like I just wanted them to use what happened to me as a case study. Um, so the aftermath was, um, you know, they went in for emergent surgery. The surgeon said that, um, you know, the infection and inflammation was just like up to my lungs. So to this day, I have like scarring and, um, you know, sick a few weeks back and like, it's just, it's really hard to recover, you know, but I've come so far. I mean, like 2021, we didn't think I was going to be able to work as a nurse again. And now I'm like rocking it, right? And doing a you know difficult job, I would say. So um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He cleaned out my belly. It was a long surgery. You know, told my mom and um, my partner that you know they weren't sure what the outcome was going to be. S super traumatic for them. Um, the funny part of the well. There's a few funny parts. Um, I remember waking up and there was a young nurse that I had, um, you know, that I had worked with. And I'd like to think I mentored some. And she was like, I'm going to take as good care of you as you take of patients and blah, blah, blah. And I saw she had like tears in her eyes. And so I was like motioning, I need to write something. And I don't know how in my head I communicated to her that was like super important what I needed to say. And I was like, I took the pen and then I made a grid for tic-tac-toe. <laughs> and she was like, Becca, I can't with you. <laughs> but like, it broke the tension in that moment, which is one of my superpowers. Um, but you know, that's... <laughs> okay, pause. <laughs> we'd, we'd, I need to describe this for the listeners who like, aren't quite aware of what this would actually look like. Becca is in an ICU. She has a breathing tube in her mouth, okay? That breathing tube is hooked to a machine 
that is breathing for her, that is keeping her alive. She is on multiple forms of life support that is literally living for her at that time. In that moment, you took the opportunity to reach out to that nurse who I'm sure you knew was feeling nervous and feeling very, um, feeling the adrenaline of having the honor of caring for someone like yourself who had meant so much to her. Um, and you did something that brought her comfort. It brought you comfort as well, but like, you're being kept alive by a machine and you're still focusing on the experience of others and their journey. And like, the, the visual of that is truly just so profound. Continue. Mm -hmm. So the question is, who won? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember. But if we actually finish the game, I feel like she would have let me win. <laughs> right? It's good nursing right there. Yeah. You build the confidence. Yeah, you know. And I can't remember if I tried to write anything, but I'm sure it was, like, illegible. <laughs> right? Um, and so I, I remember, like, kind of motioning, like, I promise I can breathe by myself. How many times have you seen this oh in the ICU, right? So many times. And um, I remember trying to be very, like, uh, cooperative, you know. But then I felt safe. I was told later, so this was a medical neuro ICU. The surgeon wanted me to go to surgical ICU. I was told later that I said, I want to come back here. And that, to me, is very profound because I worked with those nurses and I trusted them. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I trusted them. But, like, you know, when, I'm, my, when my brain was not perfusing well, yeah. I still apparently yeah. was able to articulate that. Um, uh, another fun part, I'm told that I refused a Foley catheter, which is the catheter in your bladder. And I'm told that I was like, no, not a central line, which would be in the neck or the chest. Put it in my arm. And then apparently when they told me I was going to stay on the ventilator, I was like, well, this is the medicine you need to use. <laughs> like, what a pain in the ass, right? <laughs> but my, you know, friends that were there mm -hmm. later said, like, only because it's you. Mm -hmm. Like, they let me get out of bed with a pressure of 70, you know. Which I fully support, just and so. would have you know. literally given any ICU nurse a coronary themselves. <laughs> yeah. Like, I can't tell you how many times patients would be like, can I get up and take a shower? And I'm sorry, no. Yeah. Like, you don't ambulate in the ICU. <laughs> I would not be surprised <laughs> if they that. had to, like, lift me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Yeah, it really helped you out. Yeah. For sure. Well, of course. But they did it for you because they knew that that was important. And it was yeah. necessary for your healing. Mm. And because I can be stubborn. Also that. You probably know that. It's fine. Yeah, but that's probably what kept you alive. Yeah, I you think know. so too. Um, so one of the other, like, devaluing things, I think, I kept waking up and forgetting. Oh, side note, I woke up with a colostomy, which uh, is where your large intestines dump into a bag. Um... And I kept forgetting that I had it. And that, like, really messed with my mom. Because she said that the look on my face, like, she almost, like, couldn't even finish describing that because it was just, like, you know, really messed with her. Um, but I kept forgetting. And then I remember when it, when it stuck. And it was an infectious disease doc who was very impatient with me. Um... And I kept asking questions, and she was just like, no, like that type of thing. Um, and I remember being really glad when she didn't round anymore, and one of the other infectious disease docs came by, um, who was somebody I had actually known in a professional capacity, and was um, she was really great because the OBGYN that, was, that had done the hysterectomy started saying, um, oh, well, I think you had COVID. Because, by the way, this was February of 2020. So later, 
she was like, oh, you have, you had COVID. That's why you have fluid around your lungs. Um, and the infectious disease doc was like, no, this is sepsis. This is what sepsis does to a body. And frankly, if any more time had passed, or if you were in your 40s, you would have died. So, um, you know, it's hard to remember, like, how many days had passed, but I know at some point I was hoping I'd go home. I was still having issues with, like, breathing, and I was on oxygen. But um, my wounds started, like, oozing. And I think I was trying to protect myself because I was like, no, 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 the doctor said it was fine yesterday, right? Well, it was oozing more and more, and it was getting red, and then the doc took the stitches out, or staples out, and it was a geyser. So, then started my personal journey with a wound back, um, which is a big sponge hooked to a fancy vacuum that um, is a huge pain if you can't get a seal. <laughs> so, I, you know learned a lot about the patient experience with that, uh, for about two months. Um, so I ended up getting readmitted to the hospital for, uh, fluid around my lungs, pleural effusions. And when I look back, what, one of the many things that's frustrating is I remember telling a nurse, this was after I left ICU, of course, I remember telling a nurse, like, I feel like I can't catch my breath. Like, I feel like my lungs are in a vice. And it was like, I mean, I've, I've struggled with anxiety and depression for a long time, and it's on my chart, right? So I'm sure many of us understand that feeling of, I'm anxious, I can't catch my breath. Uh, but this nurse ended up saying, you're using pain medicine to help your anxiety, and you need to stop. And I was like, whoa. Whoa. Like that, that one cut me and I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell anybody for a while. Like, cause you know, when somebody says something like that, like that to you, you're, you know, you're like, wait, am I? Of course. It's that inherent shame. So, um, then possibly the worst thing that I actually didn't tell Nicole until right before I was going in for my next surgery um, so I have struggled with PTSD for a good 20 years, but only the last 10 years, I would say, do I understand that I have that. Um, you know, I went through a lot, a lot of processing, counseling, processing other traumas. You know, it was not a linear path. And um, what I know of myself is during times of great stress, I make various noises when I sleep. And apparently, um, this sounded like I was moaning to a nurse who I woke up to mocking me. And that, that messed with me. You know, that, that one was a really difficult one to process. Uh, because the things I went through as a young adult were very devaluing. And so, um, thanks to wonderful counseling. I understand all of this, right? Uh, but, you know, sometimes in the moment you can't really process what's happening. So, um, you know, I remember that. And so as I reflect, I'm like, you know, had I not felt additionally devalued, I probably would have been able to push a little more about my lungs. Um, not that it's my responsibility, but, you know, as a critical care nurse, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the training I have has helped me quite a bit in my journey. But um, so I remember one night, it was probably two, three weeks after I'd initially gotten ill. Um, I was just feeling really bad. I mean, I'd been on oxygen, doing the breathing treatment thing. Um, I might have even been on Lasix at that point. I can't remember. But I threw up, which was actually not uncommon because I was on very pow powerful antibiotics, um, plus with all the belly stuff, right? But then I had a fever. And so went to the ER, 
was in the ER for I think a day um, because they were full. They were really, I will say that admission, the ER was great. Um, they brought like a hospital bed and, you know, but it was really rough because I, st I had the wound back. You know, I couldn't breathe. Um, and then what I remember about that admission, like I had a pleural synthesis, which is where they draw fluid off on the left and I just couldn't go anymore. Like there was more fluid, but I, I just, it's like the, it's the weirdest thing. I can't even explain how a thoracentesis feels, but you, you just you feel like you're coughing and feel like you can't catch your breath. And, um, so they were like, okay, well we got, we got enough. Right. And then we can manage the rest with Lasix because I still had fluid on my right. Not as much. So, um, I remember the ultrasound tech was just amazing and she stood out because of the care and cruelness that I'd experienced from other people, which is heartbreaking, you know, um, when you think about yourself, you, you know, in the past, you're like, gosh, it would have been nice um, for it to have gone differently. Um, but I remember this doc was like, you just need to walk more. And like, my pain was so bad. Like everywhere it was, like I have chronic pain that now I can manage really well. But when you have a wound vac and all of this stuff happening, there's only so much a person can do. And so he definitely treated me um, the way I would expect someone to, to treat uh, somebody seeking drugs but like if I was seeking drugs that wouldn't be the time to fix no, it right absolutely not. so like last year when I started jogging again and I did my first uh 5k in my head I was like yeah this one's for you mm -hmm. you know and even though he was such an a-hole like I still hope that if he's ever that sick, nobody treats him like that. Like nobody should be treated that way. So, um, at the end of my journey with the wound vac, um, that was like April, the end, of, very end of April. And my wound was still open. So home health wasn't ready to like, you know, discharge me. And I was, I don't, I don't know if you'd say I was stuck in Reno, but I was kind of stuck in Reno. And my partner had moved here, like literally right after I got out of the hospital the first time. She had taken a job here. So, um, you know, originally I, I was going to stay in Reno some, but, uh, you know, once I knew I wasn't going to be able to work, there was not really a point to staying there. Um, and so I remember this one weekend, my mom had to go be with my grandma, who was still alive at that point. And I was by myself, and I kept having um, issues. And I think, like, the home health nurse wasn't coming for a day or two, and I had to pack my own wound. And that was, like, that was something, you know. And uh, to this day, if I have an obstacle, I'm like, man, this ain't shit. <laughs> right? Like, Amen. I used to pack my wound. So, um so kind of got healthy er uh, got to a point where I was using oxygen at night and came to Columbus oxygen machine in tow. Um, thanks Delta <laughs> or Southwest, whoever I flew with. Um, and so I kept having issues like getting insurance um, because as I know now working in Ohio, um, sometimes when you work for a large organization, they have insurance that's like primarily used at their, their facilities. And so I would like went back and forth to Reno, which was pretty stressful, um, because that was the summer, the first summer with COVID. So I would go, I like wouldn't eat so that I wouldn't poop. Right. And then I wouldn't really drink and I would get very dehydrated but it was just like, I just had kind of, it was like triaging, you know? Um, being dehydrated was not as bad as having 
a bag leak on a plane because my ostomy was very poorly placed. Um, I mean, I can't blame the surgeon for that because it was emergent. And frankly, I was laying on the on the table so he wasn't gonna be able to see where I was bending you know usually if somebody gets um, one of those because of cancer or other other things uh, a wound nurse assesses like where's the best placement so but he just did the best he, he could uh, but because of the poor placement it, it made things pretty like extra tricky um, so you know lungs are getting healthier still issues but um, markedly better, right? And then I went in for my uh, colostomy reversal and woke up with a different kind of ostomy, um, uh, divert ileostomy, which is where the small intestines are picked up essentially. And like mid small intestine, I suppose, um, that became my new output, right? So, but the thing about an ileostomy is you like barely can absorb stuff like you like it just so it's like I could never get hydrated it the higher up in your intestinal tract that an ostomy is the more liquid the more acidic so it like melted my skin around it and um it was awful like I thought the colostomy was bad but the ileostomy was very bad um, it really, it was a very difficult time in this journey. Um, and, you know, I relied on YouTube. I watched a lot of YouTube videos on woodworking and, you know, various toys that I wanted. And so at some point, Nicole got me a laser engraver and um, I obsessed over that. It was like my whole day. And so... I thought it might make me stroke a couple times because it came in a lot of pieces. But I finally got that together and I mastered it. And, um, you know, um, then I was like, I wonder what I think about a 3D printer. So I started learning about those. Eventually found what 3D printers would probably call like a super old archaic one. But for me, 100 bucks, it was like awesome. Um, so that was like end of... 2020 I was I was starting to figure it out spring of 2021 I had I had figured things out I had a I had a routine I knew how to plan my errands I knew you know you adjust and so I did very well um, even though it was frustrating right I mean I would wake up and my bag would have leaked and I would cry and Nicole would be like, sweetheart, you want your ostomy, you know? And the cool part to that story is now I make cards for ostomy patients that say, you aren't your ostomy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if Nicole was sitting here, she would say she rarely says the right thing. And sometimes she's right. <laughs> but when it came down to it, when I really needed her to be, you know, to get it right, she she always did. And that was one of the times that was just really monumental for us. Um, Cause like, if somebody can love you when they have to wake up early because you literally shit the bed, like that's love, mm -hmm. right? And um, you know, I, she has actually said, if you told her when we met that this would have happened, she would have said, no way. I couldn't handle that and she totally did so um, so anyway I found a really great surgeon here in Ohio um, and this was a great part of my medical journey because she was like look I don't know if I can put you back together and you know there was a not great experience I had with a barium enema where they like look to see the viability of the end of my intestines, the beginning of my rectum, because remember I have endometriosis, right? So, um, you know, this guy, he was very, he was just too aggressive and he wasn't listening. And it was like, when I saw the images later and it was like, whoo, that was what the anastomosis or the connection between the intestines and rectum is what it looked like. I'm like, no wonder it hurt. 
-hmm. you know and then the other thing is like you don't use a part of your body for a long time and somebody puts a tube up there it's gonna be uncomfortable oh yeah and um that i kind of expected but him not listening to me was very devaluing and so um you know that was like it's like anything else as you go on if you the more trauma you have the more you have to process so it's like I would be just about to start kind of getting to a place where I was processing and then I would have something like that so now I am let's see I can't math right now but I had my ileostomy reversed in the end of August of 2021 and so um, that was pretty cool that was really cool it was nerve-wracking at first right because it's like okay you know what you have to do before you get to go home and I remember the uh, the nurses at Doan here at OSU they were like you walk a lot and I'm like I know what having an NG tube is like <laughs> so <laughs> For anybody that doesn't know, that's where they put a tube through your nose into your stomach, and it's quite uncomfortable. Um, and I'm sure anybody that knows me will not be surprised that I told them to take it out because I used one that was too big. And they were like, well, you're just going to have another one. I was like, I bet you I won't. <laughs> because, and actually, I remember what I said to that girl. First of all, it was too big, and I remember telling her that, and I could feel it ripping through my nose. Um, and that actually took a month or two to heal. It was, it was pretty painful. But I told her I would rather go without pain medicine than have that NG tube, which was way too big in my, mm -hmm. like, I'm a big girl, but apparently I have small nasal cavity. So, um, so anyway, um, so I guess I'll kind of go backwards just a little bit. Um, at some point, I honestly I can't remember how many months after the initial injury I'd had a friend that a uh, very dear friend who calls me her daughter and I certainly feel like her daughter um, said please let us do a GoFundMe and you know anybody that's had one of those done for them it's very uncomfortable especially you know they say to you well just share it I'm like but I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to put myself out there like that <laughs> And I remember that feeling and something about me, I hold on to flashes, not to dwell, but to try to use it for some purpose. You know, like I was talking earlier about, um, you know, I don't want to make sure I don't contribute to someone feeling mm -hmm. um, devalued, right? So... Um, I remember and I hold on to that feeling, that discomfort of my savings is like gone and these people want to help me. And I had just, like I lost track of people that I needed to respond to that had texted and messaged me saying like, we, please let me help. You know, I feel so helpless. The... ICU docs in South Carolina where I'd worked for five years were like, we want to take care of you, you know, um, and they were heartbroken. And I remember someone saying to me, if you had been here, that never would have happened to you. And so they were kind of processing their emotions too, like, please let us do something. We're, we feel so helpless. Um, and so yeah they did a gofundme it really helped it paid for my cobra insurance you know and that was like big and um so then i don't even know the first thing that i did to start this nonprofit. i just know that um i put myself out there and said simultaneously with the gofundme or maybe even right before um, I wanted to fundraise for myself. So I made, somebody just sent me a picture the other day. Apparently they've held up well. I wood burned like wood slices. And what I did is home. And because I could do, I was having some like tremors at that time. And I could do it um, 
because I had like these pre-done letters for the wood burner. So I made these home coasters and then the O would be the state mm -hmm. that people requested. Um, New Jersey was tough. <laughs> I'm just going to say. Um, I ended up with like, I don't know, five, six extra because I was like, nope, that one looks bad. Um, and I stained them with coffee and tea because my lungs were like an issue. Um, and yeah, you know, I'm really, I'm really proud of that. And, um, there's a lady that I used to work with that reached out and was like, how about a, uh, how about a wind chime made out of soup cans for my camper? And I was like, done. And it took a while because I wanted to be just right for her. And every once in a while she'll send me a picture and say, it's holding up, you know? And, um, you know, Nicole just... She just went went along with everything. She was great, you know. She wouldn't be able to use the stove sometimes because I'd have, like, a big thing with all the coasters, you know. And um, I made a lot of macrame bracelets initially because I was, like, hanging out in the recliner a lot. Um, and then at some point, I read an article about an ICU nurse that... Um, she started a project in the ICU in, I think, New York, and she makes blankets for patients. And so, through a stroke of luck, she actually actually responded to my my instant message or whatever. What do young people call it? DM. <clears throat> my DM. Your DM. You slid in her DMs. But I wasn't like, "Hey, boo." <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was like. You know, I can't do a lot, but can I please send some bracelets? And so what I did is I made, well, I kind of just had the bracelets. I was making them. It's an ongoing thing. And I cut out dad jokes. So each Ziploc had a bracelet and a dad joke. I love that so much. <laughs> and so one thing I was known for as an ICU nurse um, is I would tell dad jokes, right? Um and I remember, actually, when I was contracted in Nevada, there was one doc who was, like, super grumpy. He's a curmudgeon, right? And I was like, do you know that five out of four people have trouble with fractions? And he was like, what? <laughs> but then, like, eventually he kind of softened a little bit. Mm -hmm. As soft as he was going to get. Um, so, you know, I think about moments like that, and that just encourages me, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, now I, in my current position, I try to kind of inject that here and there. So I like did fundraising for myself mm -hmm. and then it just kind of over time grew into this thing where it was like, okay, I can give some stuff to other people and they can fundraise. And it's like, well, okay, that didn't quite work because if you feel bad, you can't really, you know, Mm -hmm. Like, I remember there was one girl that was like, you know, I just love this so much. I'm going to keep it for me because I don't, I'm not physically in a position where I can, you know, reliably sell stuff. So I was like, okay. So then I started doing research. Okay. Can a nonprofit just fundraise for one person? Mm -hmm. Well, no. But they can fundraise and then give to people. So it just kind of went from there and... I think the the biggest focus has been, um, you know, cards for ostomy patients and then progress, not perfection bracelets, which is um, they're just the most random thing. I was playing around with one of the graphic softwares I have, and there's a font called Hibiscus. And Hibiscus flowers bring me a lot of peace. And so it's literally PNP in that font. And so what I did is I took elastic vinyl put it on there put snaps there were many iterations of this bracelet um and then now i'm to a point where there's enough interest that i'm you know um getting a third party to do that for me mm -hmm. um so that's going to be really nice uh and then through that process my beloved dog because at that point i had one now i have two oscar is the ambassador for good for artisans for good and I uh, put a quote that I believe he would say if he could talk. 
Uh, or if he could, you know, he, he speaks Chewbacca, but he doesn't speak <laughs> English. If he could speak English, he would say, don't worry about perfection, be the goodest you can. And so that's what's on the cards. Like so, um, only other thing I wanted to share is I'm going to be doing a fundraiser in a couple weeks for a baby that got a new heart that's halfway through her, the expenses, you know, with a, uh, an organ transplant, it's like 50 grand. And that's like greatly reduced from the actual cost. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of costs associated. So, um, I invented, this is a, my own creation, I'm very proud of, it's called the T-Wrench. It is a 3D printed keychain that is a T-Rex body and a wrench mouth. But wait, there's more. <laughs> it's a 10 millimeter size wrench because if you're a tinkerer, you know 10 millimeter is the one you always lose and it's one you always need. That is awesome. So. That's really wait, cool. Wait, repeat it. What is the name of it? T-Wrench. A T-Wrench. Like a T-Rex. So I get it. Get their shells. <laughs> I had to visual. Wrench. I need the visual. I'm like imagining. Yeah. So That's cool. awesome. I was so worried about these hats that I forgot the T-Wrenches. You but know, you each will have a T-Wrench. I'm excited. So it's funny because my... Um, my in-laws are, they're so kind, and um, my the things that my mother-in-law and my late sister-in-law like are not necessarily the same things that I prefer to, to use or be around or whatever. And so the first few years that my husband and I were together, it was like my in-laws would try to get me, like, really nice gifts. Like, they are beautiful gifts, but they weren't, like, for me. Like, it would be like... Yeah a coach purse or like a Tiffany bracelet, like incredibly like, like this will look good with my hat. Right. <laughs> and so then one year they got me like a tool set, like a good, like black and Decker, like, you know, drill and like wrench set. And I was like, yes, like love this that. is what I needed. And so, um, cause I love, like, I love to like build things. I am not a, like, I am not nearly at the level that a lot of people are I like Ikea furniture or like stuff that comes in a box that I put together it's like a big 3D puzzle for adults yeah. that's pretty much what I like I'm not the person who's out there like sanding and using saws or things like that not my skill well, level you yet. could be I could be absolutely yeah. it's not my skill in my workshop level. exactly <laughs> I know just we need to do a field trip stay tuned friends I know. Totally. Yeah. But it is funny that it was like, yeah. So the the T wrench will be on my keychain because I will be the one using that. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. So I have a quick question here. So here you are. You've been a nurse for how many years prior to the big surgery? Um. Thirteen. You'd been a nurse for thirteen years. You knew the ins and outs of medicine and what was going on. Yeah. And you had it started off with the hysterectomy, right? Mm -hmm. That led then led into sepsis. Mm -hmm. That led into massive levels of medical gaslighting. That led into what sounds like a two year recovery process, basically with a wound yeah. vac and lots of counseling. I'm sure was involved. Yeah. Um, and then you come out on the other end. And you basically are like, well, I'm, you know, going to start this nonprofit organization to help all of these other people who are dealing with these chronic illness, this big medical situation, stuff that kind of comes out of nowhere. And so here you are while you feel like crap making stuff to brighten everybody else's day. Mm -hmm. How? Like, how did that was that like providing you a light in the darkness? Like, how did you get to that point where you thought like, this is the best thing to help myself? So great question. Um, it's a couple things. So like I mentioned, I struggled with depression, and anxiety for a long time. Um, it, the depression was very bad. And this is something I've not even shared with Chelsea. It was so bad in 2016 that I was ready to end my life, and I subsequently was hospitalized, um, and that was a long journey. Um, part of that journey was getting rid of a very toxic relationship, 
And so what I learned was that if I did not ensure I had something I needed to do, that the depression would be a lot worse. So that was initially um, something that kind of coincided with the desire to fundraise for myself. And then eventually, particularly when I uh, connected with the ICU nurse and sent the bracelets, it became, especially when I got feedback that people really loved it, then it was like, I feed off of that. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a helper, and that's where my um, self-concept has come from for a long time. Um, You know, I think it's taken me a long time to get to a place now where I'm like, I have value. I will not be talked to this way. Um, And even setting boundaries with some people that I love very deeply that, um, you know, are exhibiting some toxic behavior, you know, but it, it took going through that hardship to know that about myself. And so now it's a matter of, gosh, I'd love to do so much with this nonprofit, but a lot of artists are struggling. So they're not in a position to donate art or time. Um, and so, you know, I, I would like to do a lot with the nonprofit, but I also have to be realistic. At this point, there's only so much I can do by myself. Um, but I think it was a means for helping me heal. I mean, I remember when I had my colostomy takedown, I woke up with the ileostomy. I mean, like, to say I was devastated was an understatement. Um... And I remember my mom going to a craft store and us FaceTiming. Is this what you're looking for? Is this what you're looking for? And I stood in the hotel room because I ended up staying in a hotel room for several weeks um, until I could get back to Ohio. And I would stand there and hold pressure on my bag so that I could be mobile and stamp cards. And probably only one day of those weeks I really enjoyed doing it and that's when a friend came and did it with me um but I knew I needed to do something and I remember I hand sewed a bow tie for an emu at a rescue um you know anything I wasn't really I wasn't, it wasn't like a restorative, like this is filling my cup. It was like a, I need to make sure I have something to focus on. And then it was like, if I had a certain amount of energy, I would do that. If I had a little bit less, I would sketch. If I had a little bit less than that, I would watch YouTube videos on all the things I wanted to make. Um, And so it just was a very, and I'm like feeling the weight of that right now as I, as I retell this, it was a very difficult time you know because it leading up to the colostomy takedown it was like I've been through so much but it's going to be better now and then it was like whoa so um you know I think it I think it was very helpful Mm -hmm. um but it was a while you know today as I was making these hats um (laughs) I kind of was reminded how much I like creating because it's been like hit or miss through this, right? But there's been a lot that I've accomplished that, you know, I just, I, I wrote this in a paper for this, I'm in a doctorate program now, but like there was a point where we didn't know if I was going to live. Then there was a point where we didn't know what my quality of life was going to be. Then there was a point where we didn't think I could work. And like, I'm working. I got my master's last year. I'm in this new program that I'm really, you know, loving. And, um, you know, that's really, that's really great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, I just very much want to, you know, do what I can to try to help other people. And like, I can't thank y'all enough for letting me share my story because I've been like begging people at, you know, this hot, well, not recently, but like the first year, especially where this happened, like, please make this a case study. Yeah. Well, that leads me into my next question because 
you're still a nurse. You're still yeah. working. And you've, you've already mentioned, like, this has changed how I interact with my patients. I have so many more, basically, like, so much more data now as to what they're experiencing. And while I have personally never had a colostomy, I've worked with so many patients who have yeah. woken up from a surgery and ended up with something that they didn't even know was on the table. And it's it's just... When it's you like see, a violation. It is. And yeah. it's like this heartbreaking, like, almost like I lost the life I thought I was going to have. It's like a mourning process, and it is yeah. heartbreaking to see. Yeah. And you've been through the other side of that now, and you can see that recovery can happen, that a fulfilling life can occur, and you've done such amazing things. And you mentioned how you feel like this has changed how you work with your patients. And I guess my question is, like, do you think – that we're lost as a medical society in the system? Do you think that they that the system has lost the compassion for the human life? Like, how, how can, because I'm sure that you've kind of had that moment, like I know I had that moment in my career running from one patient to the next and being completely run down, mm -hmm. where it's like you, you did the best that you could in that moment, but you knew if you had a lot more time, you could have had more compassion or you could have said things a little sure. bit nicer or you kind of cut somebody's story off quickly because you had to get to that next person, you know? Yeah. How, as healthcare providers in the system, because you're not independent, right? You're still in a system, right? Mm -hmm. How are you maintaining your compassion in this environment where these types of medical gaslighting stories I hear on a regular basis and you had it one after the next after the next. How do we not be jaded in the medical community and continue to have compassion for people? Well, I think it takes constant work, right? I mean, so in my current role, I'm at a cancer hospital. Um, and for me, I keep, a, I hold somebody that came, became very close to me through this journey, like very close in my heart. Um, and she, you know, unfortunately, like I've said, if being strong was all you needed to fight cancer, like she would have beat it. But unfortunately, she um, passed away because of melanoma. And I think about her so, like, I would just tell her all the things, right? Because, like, she was going through her battle and she sat and held my hand. Um, so in my current position, I, I think about her. But as far as healthcare, you know, it's difficult because you want to fix all the things, right? And so I just try to inject perspective and knowledge into the younger nurses that I interact with. Um, because physically, I, I can't be at the bedside, really. Um, you know, in my position, I'm a supervisor, so, um, you know, I'm, like, guiding, mentoring, and then making decisions. And so my, I guess, focus is, is how can I mentor these younger nurses so that they have perspective. Um, sometimes it starts off with, hey, Hey, we're gonna have a conversation about how you're talking to me because this is not this is not gonna be tolerated, right? And then others, it's you know it's gonna be okay. What can I do for you? I'm here. You've got this. Um, and you know, speaking about the medical industry, um, generally it's hard because it doesn't seem to be any middle of the road. Mm -hmm. It seems to be like really excellent experiences, which I hear a lot about at a, at a cancer hospital, or like really bad, like mine. Mm -hmm. um, and so the only thing I can do, because I'm big on um, what, what you can impact personally. And so for me, it's like starting with the person next to you, right? So as a supervisor, everything I do with the younger nurses, and sometimes older nurses, has a trickle effect. It might be harder to get through to some of the older ones, particularly if they're grumpy. Um, but I can show them grace and then hope that eventually they kind of get to a point where they want to pass that along. Mm -hmm. So um, I, don't, I don't have the answer. I think that... Um, if there was more education, you know, just generally among, um, you know, patients, it, it would help a lot because sometimes people are like, 
I'm not sure what I need. I'm just going to go to the doctor, mm -hmm. right? And you'll appreciate this being a physical therapist. Um, I've seen several surgeons. I need a complete reconstruction, and that might be something I eventually do. Um, but I saw a physical therapist for months that was amazing, and now I know when I go to the bathroom, how do I breathe? How do I move? You know, what are the things I can do to adjust? What are the things I do for my self-care? Um, and, you know, she was amazing. She walked me through some really awkward things mm -hmm. like assessing, you know, my pelvic floor strength and function, mm -hmm. you know, pretty early on in this in this process. So, um, well, yeah, reusing your rectum you know, after you haven't been able to use it for a long time. That's one of the most like I actually had a patient who one time literally called me or she texted. She sent me a message over the weekend. She's like. I, I need to have a bowel movement. I'm I'm panicking that I'm going to rupture my repair. Yeah. And, like, I had to talk to her for, like, 30 minutes as she sat on the toilet breathing through, like, you're going to be okay. You've done this in the office multiple times. You're going to be all right. We've practiced this mechanics. But it's, like, when you're in that moment and they're telling you, don't bear down, you don't want to rupture, you don't want to, it's all that fear-mongering language that's mm -hmm. intended for education. It's intended with great good purpose initially. Right. You know? But then it's, like, you know, oh my gosh, like I haven't used this for so long. Is it going to work for me? What's going to happen? Like there's, there's a lot there. It's a pretty severe pain. Yeah. Sometimes I still have that pain, but like nothing like it was, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first, uh, eight months, I would mm -hmm. say was probably the worst, but you know, as an ICU nurse, well, I'm not currently an ICU nurse. I should clarify. Once an ICU nurse, always, always an ICU nurse. nurse. <laughs> when that, I was, there's a certain there's a certain beast. That, yeah, you know, that's, you can't get rid of that. Um, so, you are involved in very personal things, mm -hmm. right? You know, helping someone clear a blockage with your hands is, you know, and there's a certain art to putting them at ease. You know, mm -hmm. saying like. Here's what's going to happen. It's going to be uncomfortable, and I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. But if we don't do this, here's what's mm -hmm. going to happen. Because by the time they get to that point, they're like, it's it's bad, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on what brought them to the ICU. And so one of the things I was known for, other than the jokes, was uh, putting patients at ease. Mm -hmm. You know, and part of that is just the choice that I've made to try to try not to take my trauma and like put it onto other situations, right? Like, you know, to take empathy and people would feel that, right? So um, I remember this physical therapist doing the vaginal exam to check out my pelvic floor function. She's like in my face, right? And examining, you know, and it was like, hi, <laughs> like, this isn't awkward, you know, and of course me, you know, it's, it's an adjustment when you're a caregiver mm -hmm. to be on the receiving end of that. And that takes oh, a lot of, yeah. that, I mean, now it doesn't take as much work, but I'm, I mean, <laughs> I, things are a lot different now. Oh, yeah. um, but I will always be thankful for that physical therapist because A, she was like, you don't have to have surgery. And I said, to be fair, I might eventually be at that point, mm -hmm. but right now I'm not, you know. Um, and of course, the surgeons are pushing surgery. I would say one surgeon did not push surgery. Mm -hmm. um, somebody that can do like some robotic stuff, which is, is kind of cool. But, um, you know, I, it's, I, I'm, the PTSD is like, my counselor and I have called it PTSD 2.0 because mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. It sounds bad, right? And for, so when other people hear that, they're like, gosh, that's awful. But for me, it's like everything I've gone through up to this point, then like sharing the being hospitalized, like that's really tough for me. Mm -hmm. um, but had I not gone through that, I, I know it would have been a even bigger struggle. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know what life would look like. Mm -hmm. You know, so... It's weird to say, like, I'm thankful for it, but, like, I'm kind of thankful for it because mm -hmm. without it, I wouldn't have all this perspective. Right. You know, and it's certainly served me well in my current position mm -hmm. where tensions can be very high. You know, um, if you're familiar with how supervisor does, it's like, 
you know, I had one staff member say, you just disappoint people all day. And it's like, well, it's not the intention, <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, you know, if I call you and I say I need to pull back staff, you know, people are going to be mm -hmm. salty about it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so follow up question to that. Now that you have been through everything that you've been through, you've been through your own counseling for PTSD and everything, all the trauma you've had in your life. Do you feel like you would have had a different experience had it been normal standard education on an ongoing educational basis for medical providers to receive trauma-informed care training? Mm. So I think I could have had better care. Um, I feel like even beyond that, confirmation bias could have mm -hmm. been a factor um, because it's like, if you are assuming that someone's dramatic and then they're, I mean, I guess I was 37, maybe 36. I, I can't remember how old I was when this happened. I'm 40 now. So I was probably 37, but, um, I would imagine when I started needing the walker that it was probably like, yeah, see, mm -hmm. see. So it's the same. So I, I guess what I would say is that confirmation bias and uninformed care, you know, um, uninformed trauma care, however you want to word that, I would say they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, the tricky part about trauma-informed care is if you're someone like me that understands it very well, then you do it very well. And I, I've had this discussion in a, a class I'm taking um, in the, my current program that we discuss resilience, like it's hard to teach that. Mm -hmm. And I know that some people can learn it, but I'm not sure you can learn it in the same intensity that somebody that experiences that level of trauma can, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's the thing that it's like, you hate it for them because people, some people really want to understand it, you know, mm -hmm. But if their path has been different, it just looks different. Mm -hmm. There's, it's seen through a different lens. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that trauma-informed care is being pushed for mm -hmm. a lot in medical industry is fantastic. Like, I love seeing some of the um, changes I've seen about, you know, being more informed about trans people. I mean, as a lesbian, it's been super cool to see that, you know, like where I work, it's celebrated. It's not hidden. I mean, I can remember being an LPN of all of like four months. I was working as an intern and there was a lady that I, you know how, mm -hmm. you're kind of at the nurse's station, right? And she said, well, I'm going to find out who told my son it's okay to be gay and kick their ass. So I was like, back in the closet. I wasn't really out of the closet, but I was like terrified someone was going to find out, you know? And so like I said nothing. And then as an LPN, you're in a position of relying on RNs. You know, you can't give IV medicine. So if you need it for your patient, it's kind of like, I don't want to tell them anything that's going to make them not want to help me. So you can kind of see how this relates to my medical stuff right that moment where I'm looking at my friend thinking please don't make them mad because mm -hmm. then I won't get what I need whereas when I was an LPN it was like I don't want to make anybody mad because I wanted to make sure my patients had what they needed um so to think about that versus now where people are like cool mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah like it, it's not a thing, um, so that has that has been really, that's been really nice. Yeah, you know. So, I think we have a long way to go as far as trauma informed care. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, it starts with the person next to you, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you work with somebody that's not very informed, you know, you you want to just like inject the knowledge, mm -hmm. be like, can I just give you perspective? Mm -hmm. But you can't. Right. Yeah. It's not. I mean, there's a lot of evidence out there that. That's just not how it works, mm -hmm. you know, and you're certainly, you're not going to get anywhere if you, like, 
-hmm. listen here, mm -hmm. you know. This is what you should do. I remember my first, my first even like slight introduction to the fact of like, other people have different lives than you have and you don't know what's going on. It was when, it was my first hospital job, so like a million years ago. And um, I don't even know if it was just my manager. My manager was like a very like devout Christian man. Um, and I don't know if it came from him or if it came from like higher ups, but it was something he had everybody sit around at a staff meeting and he pulled it up on his computer. And it was actually like a commercial from like Chick-fil-A. Hmm. And it was about, it was basically, like, there were no words, but it was just basically, like, panning through this restaurant of Chick-fil-A, just showing interactions between people. But it was, like, it was like, an air, like, an arrow, like, husband just passed away. Yeah. Their car broke down on the way to work. Their parents are getting divorced. Like, and you just, and everyone's just interacting, like, everything is fine. But it was just showing, basically, like, you don't know what's going on behind the screen. You don't know what's mm -hmm. going on behind closed yeah. doors. And just because somebody presents as if they've got it together, they're doing just fine, or whatever the case may be, doesn't always mean that that's actually the case. They may be one angry comment away from losing it, yeah. or one kind comment away from, like, taking their own life, you know? Like, it just doesn't really... And that was, like, my first introduction of, like, oh, my gosh, like, these people are not... This is not just my shoulder patient or my hip patient or my pelvic floor patient. This is Mary who can't brush her own hair because she just had a shoulder replacement and, oh, she's also mourning the death of her husband, you know? Yeah. And it just gives you this different level of care for the human in front of you other than, like, okay, let me just check your range of motion, let me check your goals, blah, 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 let's get this in and let's send this out to task. Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's a totally different perspective. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, from the pelvic PT side of things, I think... I think the profession of public PT as far as the physical therapy world is potentially a little bit further ahead in this just because of the mm -hmm. nature of what we do. There's a lot more training in trauma-informed mm -hmm. care. We yeah. deal with we work with a lot of sexual assault survivors and trauma and stuff like that just because of public floor is so intimately related to that part of the nervous system. Yeah. Um, but I find that if we can get more knowledge in the hospital system to recognize that this is the human in front of you, but not even that, to have the hospital systems recognize that treating the person in front of you as a person versus a task actually takes more time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, which means that if we're going to be spending more time with the people in front of us, then we need to have more staff, which means that we need to not just keep saying like, Nurses are heroes. Great job. It means like we know we actually need to put enough people, enough bodies mm -hmm. here yeah. to treat the people at hand so that you can treat the person in front of mm -hmm. you with compassion and kindness. And, and then teach that in the culture that you have. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and like giving accolades to that, you know, like mm -hmm. like bringing that to light, talking about how that was such a great experience instead of like, oh, but if you don't hit your numbers of productivity, you're not going to be eligible for a raise. You know, mm -hmm. why not like, oh, if you get five notes from a patient saying how great your excellent care was, then now you are eligible for a phrase, right? That now we have a totally different perspective on like, what are we doing in this moment? Am I just trying to get you out the door mm -hmm. or am I trying to make sure that you feel safe and cared for and loved? And, you know, because right. that's the reason we all go into healthcare to begin with. Like you said, you're a helper. Like, yeah. even when you're, like, on your deathbed, you're like, oh, there's people out here who are hurting them to make them some bracelets. Like, because you're a helper, right? You made these sweet hats, man. I'm Same. loving it. Tic-tac-toe. Um, I know, right? Playing some tic-tac-toe to lighten the mood for the yeah. nurse, you know? Like, that is the nature of most healthcare professionals. But we get in these arenas where we're told all these other things are important and it doesn't give us that opportunity to treat the person in front of mm -hmm. us. And so I'm really sorry that you had that experience, but I'm happy for you that you have found such a positive avenue from that experience it's, to be able to help and the choice, the yeah. trickle effect. Yeah. Yeah. Life is choices. Life is choices. Choose your heart. Truly choose your heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just alchemized pain right there and turned it into kindness and mm -hmm. connection and support for others. Mm -hmm. I mean, the gift that you've brought to so many people who, like you know, are in their lowest of lows and their darkest of days that um, just needed to be able to see that there was light at the end of the tunnel for someone. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a train. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And pay love forward. I don't think I told you that yet. Um, so it's, uh, I applied for a trademark for the Artisans for Good. Uh -huh. Pay love forward. 
Oh, I like that. It feels very right. That yes. is very good. Yeah. That's yeah. perfect. So. So can we talk more about Artisans for Good? Like, how does one get involved? How does one donate? How does one help? This was, Is this where we say link in the comments or something? I think you'll take care of that. She'll get you set up with yeah. that. <laughs> she sure will. If you want a tea wrench. Yes. Check out the website. So they can, so our listeners can go onto your website and they can order a tea wrench. And this tea wrench, the proceeds from this tea wrench are going to help support this. Ariana, a little baby mm. that got a heart. Mm. Okay. So awesome. she does have her heart. She has her heart. Good. She's um, she's doing well. Great. She has just the most amazing parents that are um, nurses from South Carolina that are just like, good humans you know mm -hmm. and I, you know when I found out that this that their little baby was going through this it was just like I just felt that pain mm -hmm. for them and anybody that's ever met this little one's parents I mean they just I just adore them they're just like the sweetest people um, and you know you want to help any baby but it really helps when the parents are extra sweet, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, um, but yeah, the tea wrench and then also uh, stickers that say, tell your dog I said hi. Aww. Tell your cat I said ps, 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 ps. Mm. <laughs> So those are already on there. Okay. Um, and then I'll be selling some shirts for $25, 10 of which would go to mm -hmm. the, the baby's fund. Okay, awesome. So, so you mentioned how you you can help like a lot of different people like do you have like multiple families that you want to work with or is it like we're going to work with this family for a certain period of time until we meet their goal or like how do you or if you like if people are like oh my gosh like I love Becca's story I really connect with her and we could really use some help or I know a family who could use some help like how absolutely many can you reach out okay. like as of right now I have um this one baby that I'm fundraising for um if there's artists out there that want to donate goods, want to work with me, I would love to help all the people. Mm -hmm. But then I need some of the people to that are you. interested in, yeah. in joining forces with me. Absolutely, so. team up. Absolutely. Um, I have an unrelated but equally important question to ask here. Um, what is your favorite dad joke? Hmm... I have to I have to give a little background into this story, or into this joke. Um, I told Nicole, so Nicole and I have been together almost five years, and in the beginning, you know, we're both like working, doing our thing, and so I would like text a first part of a joke and then the second part. Texted the first part, and then I got really busy at work, and she didn't get the second part, and she was Googling because I asked her, have you heard about the new restaurant on Mars? She did not literally think there was a restaurant on Mars, but she thought maybe it was some hip, cool new hangout uh -huh. called <laughs> Restaurant on Mars. But the punchline is great food, no atmosphere. And oh so I was gosh. like, <laughs> sorry. Angel halo emoji. Oh my gosh, that is <laughs> so funny. Kiss emoji. But probably the one I, I use a lot is, uh, do you know that five out of four people have trouble with fractions? Because a lot of people are like, wait, wait, what? what? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, <laughs> that's, that's dumb. <laughs> but I still get them to laugh. Yeah. My husband's the king of dad, dad jokes. I mean, it's just like, like I don't know what brand of like Popsicle is it that always has a jokes on it on uh -huh. the Popsicle stick, you know? I, yeah. I don't remember the brand, but I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, so he, like, that's like a competition in the house, like over the summer when there's Popsicles. It's like, the kids will like read it to dad and can he come up with it? And it's, I mean, I five I out of four that. times he does. I yeah. love that. <laughs> that's cute. It's fantastic. It's love like, that. Uh, do you know this one already? He's like, no, it just made sense. None of these make sense. Are yeah. you kidding me? Yeah. But yeah, he has the, the brain of a child sometimes when it comes to that. He just like sees it and, and goes with it. And it's, it's funny. They have a good time with that. So that's why I like it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brain of a child. The brain hey. of a child. Got Which it. is what we all need, quite frankly. The adult Amen. brain is, is, is uh, bogged down with a lot of stuff. And that child, we've had, yes, we've had a couple PTs on recently, and they 
have all been like, we need to get in more play. We need to get more play. Kids have mm-hmm. so much joy and we need yeah. to have more play. And it's like, that's exactly it. We, um, my son and I, well, actually all the kids and I, we play the Disney music game. So we get on to like Amazon and we put on like Disney music and whoever can guess the song, like the, the movie that it's from first gets a point. <laughs> And so my my one son and I play this all the time. Then he's like, once the answer is given, he's like, okay, skip, okay, skip, okay, skip, because he like wants to get more points in. Yeah. And then I'll just sit there and just like start singing all the songs and stuff. He's like, okay, mom, but skip, mom, we're almost to my school, mom, come on. And so yeah, so we we did do a little bit of play this morning. It was fun. That's like my style that. of play. <laughs> you should play that. some Led Zeppelin. Be like, you don't know what that is. Do I you? know. <laughs> well, so I was a Jimi Hendrix fan, and so we started playing that, and the kids were all. It wasn't. It wasn't their jam. They yeah. were not a fan. They were like, it's too loud. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm all over the map when it comes to my, my flavors of music. But yeah. Disney to Jimi Hendrix, yeah, and anywhere in between, except for country, which breaks the hearts of multiple people in my lives. But I am not a huge country music fan. <laughs> not even she thinks my track is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, I saw um, a reel on Instagram one time, and it was so funny contrasting, like male country singers and what they sing about with like female country singers and what they sing about. And it was like the men are like, "I miss my girl, I miss my dog, I want to drink a beer and drive my truck," and like the girls were like, "I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna light his yeah. shit on fire." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh my." <laughs> what a metaphor. I'm like, that took a turn yeah, quick. That took a quick turn. Quick turn. Uh, okay. That's well, fantastic. before we wrap this up, I do have to say I am loving the hat so much. Yes. And that one is, I think, I don't know, this one or that one are my favorites, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, this one turned out really well. I love that one. Like the purple, really, really good. This looks really good. Really, yeah. really good. So I prompt Chelsea wanted me to tell you my recent hat story. Oh my okay. god, I totally okay. forgot about this. Yes, yes, the hat story. Here we go. So I am a big hat wearer. I have one hat that I wear since I stole it from my husband maybe a decade ago. It's a blue jackets hat, and it's you know blue on the sides. It's got the emblem in front. It's a white stripe in front, but also it's got like a colored real like that one has like the purple. Um, and because I've worn it for a million years, it's obviously like bled a little bit into the white, right? But same hat I wear all the time. And we were all on a call recently, and they they were like, oh my gosh, we've never seen you in a hat before. I was just wearing like a beanie, and I was like, oh, I wear a hat like 90% of the time that I'm not at work. And so that weekend we had soccer games, had my hat on, took a picture. I was like, see, hat time. Um, so last weekend we went to kind of like it was a, a spiritual awakening trance dance with a woman that we had met recently who was phenomenal. Basically, what we do is we all came into this room. There were maybe eight or nine of us, and we had to wear blindfolds. So, like, everybody was, like, you're just in the dark, basically. And that way you can just kind of, like, move however your body wants to move without any fear of judgment. And so the person, like, moderating it basically is just there to make sure you don't run into people, you know? She's like, I don't judge. I've done these a million times. Like, I've seen weird stuff. Like, you're not going to surprise me. Do whatever you're going to do. And so... Because this was a little bit out of my element, I show up in my hat, and I have my hat, like, way pulled down. (laughs) I'm, like, in my tiny little cocoon of, like, safety. And then we had to put on our, like, masks. So then I, like, have my mask, like, underneath my hat. So I'm, like, totally blind with my hat pulled down. And But then my back was getting sore as we were doing the meditation. So I decided to, like, roll over onto my belly, and I, I... couldn't get down because the (laughs) front of my hat kept hitting the ground so I like you know switched my hat around and I put my mask on on top so I'm like chilling in my like mask and so I think I must have been one of the last people to like take it off but Chelsea was like seeing you in a backwards hat with like a mask over your eyes was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen I'm like yeah I can imagine it was probably pretty ridiculous so funny but it was like yeah like I went down to like it was like bam Oh man, I can't wear my hat like that. Hold on a second, I flipped it around. I've been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look so cute with your. She had her braided pigtails and her hat and her (laughs) her eye mask. And I like looked over and we were. It was called a jaguar trance dance. Okay, and it was like this shaman, this woman who was done shamanic training, and it was this very beautiful like spring ritual, and like we were. All of us didn't really know what to expect, Mm -hmm. right? We're like we're here for the woo, Mm -hmm. and I just laid on us. I look over and. (laughs) 
<laughs> so here, see, here's one of the, the background situations here is that we're learning more about human design. I don't know if you've heard of human design at all, but um, basically one of the things that, that talks about like your feminine and your masculine energy and which one is your more subconscious and which one is your more conscious energy. And mine is my subconscious energy is more masculine, which totally makes sense because whenever I'm feeling stressed out or anxious, I definitely have like a come at me bro energy. <laughs> and I've worked really, really hard to be like, and let's bring in the feminine and try to live more in that feminine. So it's like a higher pitch, come at me, bro. <laughs> it's like, come at me, bro. No. <laughs> it is more like, hmm, let's just maybe understand that the reason that you are feeling a little bit more masculine right now is because you're feeling stressed out. What are we stressed out about? So it's allowing me to kind of explore that a little more. But it was not surprising to me that during this, like, I grabbed my hat to go. Like, I could have just worn my hair in pigtails, but I was like, nope, need the hat. Yeah. We're wearing the hat, you know. And that when we were getting into it, it was like, well, I could have just, like, stayed lying on my back or on my side. But I was like, nope, we're flipping the hat around. We're going straight dude mode right now. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's what this. we're doing, you we know. Um, and, and, yeah, it was just, I could even tell, like, my, my like, posturing when we were, like, talking about stuff later was like Like, very masculine you know mm -hmm. and and I was just like I mean like my heart was like racing on the way home and I was just like oh girl you gotta chill take it down (laughs) but then there was this beautiful connection between you and another member oh my gosh yes this lady she just like you know when you meet somebody and they just have a vibe about them that you're like I need to know this person you know Mm -hmm. and she was 80 years old And she kind of said something that basically said, like, I'm just going to live my life. Like, I am not going to be burdened by what I'm told I shouldn't be doing. I'm just, like, it sounded like she was just starting her life at 80 Mm -hmm. years old. Making the most of it. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a, like, beautiful, beautiful moment. And um, so I, like, went over and I was, like, talking to her afterwards. And she almost had this, like, she almost had the sadness about her of, like, mourning but also excitement about what was to come. It was a very interesting kind of dynamic and stuff. And, like, as we got to talking and stuff like that, and I was just sharing with her, like, I really appreciate the wisdom that you shared today because she just seemed like one of those people that it's like, I need to I need to go hang out with so-and-so today because, like, I just need to get grounded again, you know? And as we were talking, like, I just started leaking like a faucet. And for somebody who's, like, kind of a little bit more in the masculine energy, like, people don't see me cry except for my husband and then maybe my mom or my sisters, you know, but like very, very small group of people. I don't really cry in front of people. And I'm sitting here like a freaking faucet in front of this woman and Chelsea and Abigail are kind of like across the room. Like, should we go? Should we not? What's going on here? And I'm like, <laughs> it was, it was, it was totally fine guys. It was great. It was, it was totally fine. fine. It was beautiful. It was a moment of yeah. just um, yeah. pure emotion and connection. And it was like, it just was so, ironic and so beautiful how you had shown up in this like I'm, I'm out of my comfort zone I'm mm-hmm. in my masculine I'm, I'm I'm got my, my hat. I got my, my I got my hat on I got my I walls just want to know if she was wearing a t-shirt with the sleeves cut off <laughs> no I wasn't what was I wearing I think I was wearing yeah I was wearing like leggings and like a baggy shirt though yeah yeah like, mm-hmm. I wasn't like looking real cute well no I'm thinking like because leggings and a baggy shirt is is what a Feminine, right? It's mm-hmm. feminine. I'm, run, I'm running errands, but nothing says bro like a hat <laughs> and a cut off and a cut-off. shirt with cut off sleeves. Funny you should mention right. that. Story time number two. So the way that I would weed out guys to date in high school was that we had a. I don't think I've told you this. Nope. I? So we had a basketball court in our backyard. We lived out in the country. My dad was a varsity basketball coach for many, many, many years, and so all of my siblings and I we all played basketball. Other sports as well, but mainly basketball for me. And um, so during the summer, like, we would always have all these games over. We'd have all our friends over. My mom would always get those uh, little, like, freezer pops that, mm. you know, and, and bottled water and everything. And then we'd go down and we'd play video games. And so basically I would wear my my baggy basketball shorts, you know, because we're talking early 2000s, right, mm-hmm. where everything was, like, down to your ankles basically, mm-hmm. um, with, like, my, my cut-off, you know, baggy T-shirts, and I'd be dripping sweat, and, like, you know, we're on blacktop with, like, grass mm-hmm. around us, like, mud, so we're just covered in, like, dirt and mud and blacktop and stuff like that, and it was, like, if a guy would play basketball with me and actually play hard, right, and, like, play, play, mm-hmm. and then we would go down into the basement – 
and like play video games and they still wanted to talk to me in a romantic way I was like okay we're good like if any of this like turns you off like you're not my person because this not gonna change like you can slap a dress on there you can put a little bit of makeup on every now and then but at the end of the day I'm still that nasty sweaty girl wearing the cutoff t-shirt playing basketball yeah but it was funny because the first time that Ryan and I played together He's a he's That's a, your husband. Yeah, yeah. He's a very very athletic guy. He played hockey, played baseball. Very very quick, and so he but was not a basketball player. Like his shot crushes my soul just a little bit. It's one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. Highly effective for some reason, which is yeah. insanely annoying. It's like when people bowl, yeah, and they, and they just like and, and do it between their legs. Yeah, it's like come on, seriously. Like, yes. how, did, how did that happen? Exactly. Yeah. So he would have like he had this massive vertical, but his follow through was like to here. He looked like a T Rex. He was just like, Arr! but he like would jump so high that like he would get over me. Keeping in mind, I had like a three and a half inch vertical, so that wasn't that hard to do. But still, <laughs> the first time that we went against each other, and he went or I he like let me get by him and I scored I was like I've seen you play hockey there's no way that you're actually trying right now and um but I had to get I was getting mad because he was like beating me and not because he was beating me but because I was losing and I didn't like that and so he let me get around when I scored and I grabbed the ball I'm like did you just let me get around you and he was like what and I was like and I grabbed the ball and I shoved it in his stomach and I pushed him away I'm like don't you ever let me beat you like that again <laughs> and then he crushed me but <laughs> that was exactly what I like if I'm gonna score on you I want to know that I scored and that it wasn't like you were just being easy on me right. right like if we're playing Halo and I respawn and you headshot me like that's on me like I should have gotten cover sooner uh-huh. you know like I don't want to like think I'm good at something and I'm not just because you're like trying to be nice about it you know and so, yeah, like, that was, like, the first time that we had, like, a one-on-one, like, hangout. And he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so he just, like, he's like, right. you asked for and it. And he was, like, way faster than me. So, yeah, he, like, crushed me. It was great. And he was probably like, I'm I'm so scared, but also turned on. <laughs> this might be my the love of my life. <laughs> and it turned out he was. So, um, did he yeah, know? yeah, that was funny. He also asked me out over taking the trash out. Yeah, we've been really romantic since day one, guys. You should be jealous. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, we have a 750-foot driveway at my house. Mm -hmm. And um, we were, like, had, like, the big rolly bins and stuff. And we were, like, walking down the driveway. And I had gone from basically, like, relationship to relationship since about seventh grade. Um, and so you guys were friends first. No, no, no. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we were friends. Um, but like, I had basically like my entire self worth was wrapped up in like a boyfriend, you know, right. as I think many girls are between mm-hmm. seventh and yeah. you know oh, yeah. the rest of their life. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, not great. Yeah. So I had told my my one sister like, do not let me date anybody because I had come out of a very toxic relationship, very narcissistic human being who kind of made me feel like hot garbage, and it was just like I need. I needed to figure this out for myself. And then Ryan comes into the picture. And Chelsea's like, uh, Allison doesn't want to be dating anybody right now. Like, you're not, she's not supposed to be dating. And, um. Not you, Chelsea. Sister my sister. Chelsea. Yeah. Um, and so he and I basically hung out nonstop. And so as we were, like, walking down the trash, we got to the end. And he just kind of looked at me and he was like, so what exactly is the deal here? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. He didn't hand you like a piece of paper that said, are we going like out? Yes Check or no. yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. It was basically like, like, yeah, I, I'm not supposed to be dating anybody, but also like we drive really well together and we ended up obviously getting married and having lots of babies and, um, it's been a good journey. But I, I think about that a lot of times, like, you know, what, what if I'd been like, no, I'm not supposed to be dating somebody, and then, like, I just, mm-hmm. like, totally missed that opportunity? Mm-hmm. Like, that would have been crappy. But, anyway. Good thing you didn't. Good thing I didn't. Good thing. And he's just yeah. so rom- romantically asked me out over the over garbage, garbage. bins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. So. Anyway. For all those youngsters out there that are looking to find their their person. Yes. You, you need to look in the dumpster. And look. <laughs> <laughs> Look in the dumpster. Exactly. Well, and then, too, like, the other side of that is if you can have fun mm-hmm. taking the trash out. Oh, yeah. You can have fun doing fun stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He was a fun guy. So we still laugh a lot. Thank yeah. you so much for coming today. This has just been an incredible opportunity for us to mm-hmm. really get to hear your story and share your message with the world and what 
you know, our listeners. Your, your, your puzzle piece, your corner, mm -hmm. that you're Thanks trying to make a better me. place. Mm -hmm. It's been wonderful and magical. Wonderful and magical. You're rocking that hat. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I love the hat. I really think we should turn the lights down and show the glow in the dark. Part. Oh, I think so too. Yeah. Before we do that, could we just maybe make a statement that I need more hats? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because when Nicole listens to this, yeah. I think it's important. I think it's important too that, that she, she knows I need. You need more hats. More hats. You yeah. need it's the hats necessity. to support the things that are important to you. Yeah. How is how are other people going to know what's important if you are not wearing the hats? Exactly. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might hear again that I have too many, uh, and you know that could but, be you true. Know what's but cool about hats, you can stack them. Mm. You can stack them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, on that note, thank you, everybody, so much for listening today. I hope you have learned um, how to be an advocate for yourself, how to be compassionate for people you don't know what's going on in their world, and, you know, we are, we are not a burden for asking for help. Um, and also that even in our darkest time, we can still bring joy and light to other people. And that can in turn provide joy and light for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We hope everybody has an absolutely fantastic week. Yay. Yay. Round of applause. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this emotional journey. This episode has had a little bit of everything and I hope you found it as cozy as I did to be a fly on the wall. Please check out the show notes below for information about how you can get in touch with Becca and join her in her mission with Artisans for Good. There are so many ways you can help, and you can do it knowing that your contribution is supporting truly wonderful people. You can also find links to join the Healing Art community and become a part of the discussion and join us on this journey towards healing, enlightenment, and abundance. Until next time, this has been the Healing Art of Being You, wishing you love and light. <laughs>